Good evening. And welcome to Christ Lutheran Church. We're very glad that all of you are here. For any guests or visitors, uh, if you haven't yet picked up one of our visitor gift bags in the narthex, please do so. And we always encourage and welcome you into our midst as we gather for the divine service each week. As we gather together today, as we're in God's house, we uh, have a few announcements. One is that uh, next week is Reformation Sunday already, and that's hard to believe. Uh, it's not, qu not quite the same as last year's 500th anniversary celebration of the Reformation, but of course it is each year something very special to remember the basics of the Christian faith that were uh, renewed as the, the Reformation uh, took place. So we're reminded that we're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. As we gather together today also, uh, we have uh, an, another upcoming Sunday, All Saints Day, the first Sunday in November and or Thursday. We always kind of lump Thursdays and Sundays together and that's natural, I guess, but we'll be celebrating All Saints Day, and as we do that, we'll also remember the faithful departed, those who have, who have died in the faith uh, since last All Saints Day. Uh, so that will be something special during the worship service that day. Also in our announcements, a huge thank you to everyone that has supported the Military Bible Sticks. We have uh, begun that uh, program once again, and just, boy, your generosity is is overwhelming. We've already received $1,325 for military Bible sticks, which is so important and so needed for our um, people that are in the military. Uh, for these to be distributed, it takes a chaplain saying, yes, I have men and women who are desiring to have God's word in this military Bible stick form. And so that is how they get the orders that go out. And so none are wasted. As we think about that, uh, also in our own church, just want to encourage you to uh, think of uh, men and women in the armed service that you may know uh, that uh, uh, would be people that don't have a church home, perhaps, that you would like to invite uh, for, for Veterans Day to our worship service that day. If you know of such people, give us the names and we'll have a, a special uh, remembrance for them. We'll provide a military Bible stick for those individuals as well. So please do, if you know of any names and can invite people, get us those names into the church office so that we can be ready for that. As we gather together today also, just a couple of quick reminders that if you'd like to volunteer for SOS Super Socks to serve at that uh, community food pantry, uh, they are uh, definitely in need of all kinds of different things. So um, we have uh, a lot of hardworking volunteers already who are regularly uh, part of that from our congregation. If you're interested or if you'd like to uh, donate anything towards that, uh, we have the contact information in our newsletter. You can contact uh, Gail Tamala, the Super Sox Coordinator for Christ, and her number is listed there uh, for more information. Or you can always contact the church office as well. And the last thing is Operation Christmas Child. Donations are due in, in one more week. Uh, so um, please uh, help us if you haven't already. Uh, get those shoe boxes together and um, we currently have enough money to send 40 shoe boxes it costs just nine dollars to send a shoe box with the gospel materials all donations are due next week there's a table in the narthex where thank you to all who have already donated towards that some people were bringing in a shoe box today even so that is wonderful those are a few of our announcements now please join me in a word of opening prayer so we get ready for our worship service today dear heavenly father we give you thanks for your holy word it truly is that two-edged sword that that is able to penetrate into the core of our very being and to uh, work in our lives by the power of your Holy Spirit so 
that we can come to faith in Jesus Christ and so that faith can be strengthened each time we hear your word and read your word and each time that word is proclaimed and preached to us. Each time we are taught that word, we pray that in the power of your word today, we would be once again showered with your mercy and grace, which we need each and every day of our lives. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we get ready for our opening hymn, O Day of Rest and Gladness. We'll stand on the fourth and final stanza of our opening hymn. of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. There remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works, as God did from his. For our intro it, we read it responsively. From Psalm 34. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted, and saves the crushed in spirit. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes his boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and delivered me from all my fears. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted, and saves the crushed in spirit. 
we sing our hymn of praise, How Sweet the Name of Jesus Sounds. pray. O God, our Creator, you set in order all things in heaven and on earth for the benefit of your children. Grant that we rest from our labors and receive the peace your Son has given through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for our Old Testament reading. Our Old Testament reading is from Ecclesiastes chapter 5. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. When goods increase, they increase who eat them, and what advantage has their owner but to see them with his eyes? Sweet is the sleep of a laborer, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. There is a grievous evil that I've seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt, and those riches were lost in a bad venture. And he, he is father of a son, but has nothing in his hand. As he came from his mother's womb, he shall go again, naked as he came, and shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away in his hand. This also is a grievous evil. Just as he came, so shall he go. And what gain is there to him who toils for the wind? Moreover, all his days he eats in darkness and much vexation and sickness and anger. Behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun the few days of his life that God has given him, for this is his lot. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and to rejoice in his toil, this is the gift of God. For he will not much remember the days of his life, because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our epistle reading is from Hebrews chapter 4. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest, as he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage he said, they shall not enter my rest. Since, therefore, it remains for some to enter it, 
and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience, again he appoints a certain day, today, saying through David so long afterward in the words already quoted, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Or if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God, for whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works, as God did from his. Let us, therefore, strive to enter that rest, so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our gospel lesson is from the Gospel of St. Mark. Please stand. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And again the disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. They were exceedingly astonished and said to them, said to him, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, See, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now and this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecution and in the age to come eternal life, but many who are first will be last, and the last first. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated, and we continue with our sermon hymn, Come Unto Me, Ye Weary.
the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. What I'm about to tell you is nothing new and will not surprise you in the least. Not a lot of people are in love with Mondays. <laughs> we don't like Mondays in general. There is, in fact, a saying that goes like this. This is the Mondayest Monday that ever Mondayed. Have you ever had a Monday like that? I think we all, on some level, can relate. If it weren't for coffee, I don't know how I'd make it through some Mondays, to be honest. And actually, it's not in our, in our imagination, it's not in our heads. There are scientific reasons why Mondays are so rough, according to an article in the Mental Floss website. First of all, on Mondays, we suffer because our sleep patterns have been interrupted by our weekend activities, even if we manage to sleep in during the weekend. And the second thing is our patterns of socializing have been disrupted by the weekend also. So once we get to the workplace, we have to kind of re-get acquainted with one another, so to speak. There's a little bit of anxiety that can go along with that. The third thing is that emotionally, it's the day of biggest change. And so we tend to remember the things that are difficult the most that happen on Mondays. Also, on Monday, at the beginning of the work week, we often take stock in ourselves, and not always are we entirely pleased with the results. And so Mondays can be a little hard on our self-esteem. And Mondays, believe it or not, we are a little less healthy. They have found that even for people that maintain their weight, they weigh just a little bit more on Mondays. And statistically, on Mondays, you're more vulnerable to various health risks. And last but not least, there is that thing called a job. And according to a massive Gallup poll, 70% of people hate or at best are completely disengaged from their jobs. And as a result, it turns out that 37% of job applications are submitted on Tuesday <laughs> after one rough Monday or another. So yeah, chances are that at least some of us have experienced one of the Mondayest Mondays that ever Mondayed. It's worth it though, right? Because well, can you imagine not having a weekend at all? The truth is, in our cycle of seven days that we call a week, this, of course, goes all the way back to creation, where God created the world in six days and rested on the seventh day and called it the Sabbath day. And so God's rest began as a specific time, the day on which God rested, having created the world. A day of rest. That does sound nice, doesn't it? It does sound like music to our ears. And the author of Hebrews, as we have seen in our text, has a unique way of describing our promised rest. You could say that the rest that God provides us is indeed the most restful rest that has ever rested. That's good news for us any day of the week. So let's together talk about our promised rest. 
as we look at our text, it contains a, a sobering reminder of what happens when you don't enter God's promised rest. It tells us about what happened to the generation of Israelites that disobeyed God in the wilderness. That is a, a reference to what happened at Meribah and Massa. There the people of Israel quarreled with Moses in, in the wilderness and argued with him because water was scarce in that place. And they said, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? They also tested the Lord and asked out loud, Is the Lord among us or not? That is, when God had Moses strike a rock with his staff, and out from the rock water flowed so that people could drink it. But Moses called that place Meribah, which means quarreling, and Massa which means testing because of what happened there. I wouldn't be surprised at all if Meribah and Massa happened on a Monday. I say that tongue-in-cheek, but just a little bit. <laughs> so, the author of Hebrews points out that the problem went deep. The Israelites missed the opportunity that they had, an opportunity in the midst of their terrible Monday or whatever day it was, even in their trials and the lack of water that they were experiencing, to have faith in God. As a result, they personally did not enter the promised land of rest. For God's promised la rest is, is a land as well as a time, as we shall see. In fact, only the descendants of that original generation that wandered in the wilderness would enter into the promised land of Canaan. And that's bad, of course. It's a terrible result of, of a lack of faith in God, but there is a silver lining to all of this that is spoken of in our text as we look at that example from the Old Testament. For if not even Joshua, the, the leader that followed Moses in the next generation, if not even Joshua and the people with him entered the promised rest that was ultimately spoken of, then there remains the opportunity for all of us to enter the promised rest of God. To put it another way, it is open season for entering God's promised rest. The time is now. The day is today. For we live in the span of time where we have the opportunity and the ability to look back on the death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ and to look forward in time to his return on the last day. So what is God's rest? Let's review that. It is not only a time when God rested, it is also a day that God gives us to have the opportunity for faith in him. And it was represented, if you will, by a place. As we look at all of the Old Testament, we see that the place of God's promised rest was the tent that, that David built for the Ark of the Covenant and later on the temple that was in Jerusalem, and later on Jerusalem itself called Mount Zion. We see the promises in the Old Testament that God would be king eternally from Mount Zion, and from Mount Zion he would give us a Savior 
who would deliver God's people so that we could be God's chosen people, so that we could be a, a, a royal priesthood. And all, all who are needy would be provided for on Mount Zion. That's a lot to think about, but it all goes back to one thing, that God promised each of us that we would receive rest through our Savior, Jesus Christ. For in Jesus we have forgiveness of sins. In Jesus, God came to earth, and Jesus fulfilled all righteousness for us. On our behalf. And so, because he did that, no longer would we have to go through life chasing windmills and dreaming the impossible dream that somehow we could do enough to earn God's favor and love. For God has given us his son, Jesus Christ, who worked salvation for us by dying on the cross rising from the dead. Without this gift of rest in Jesus, it really would be the most Mondayest of all Mondays that you could ever possibly imagine that ever Mondayed. We'd be constantly trying to earn God's favor, but forever we would be frustrated by our own sin, and forever we would be weighed down by the burden of our guilt, and forever would we suffer the, the fate of condemnation. But because of Jesus, we are set free from the curse of the law of sin and death, and we are declared righteous before God and given eternal life. This is the, the amazing expression that we are given right now of the rest that God has promised to us and all who believe in Jesus Christ. Our text contains these words. It begins with these words. It says, therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. And, and this is a good statement of the theme of the verses that we have as our epistle lesson for today. The fear that it speaks about is being diligent and vigilant, careful and watchful when it comes to our salvation. It is remaining in the one true faith through the means of grace that God has given us so that we may be strengthened in our faith. As it also says in Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. Who doesn't like insight? Who doesn't want insight? It's a common goal of humanity and a common goal of psychology, for example, to help people gain insight, to give people the facility of seeing into the inner character of something or to see into the underlying truth of things and understand their relationships and their sources of emotional difficulty or, or what may motivate them. So people are directed even in churches and in books and by so-called experts, to their own thoughts and their own actions in an effort to gain insight. We are told, just let go of things as if it were something we could do to help ourselves, almost like Peter saying, look, Lord, we've left everything to follow you.
Modern-day authors and speakers often paint a picture of faith as if it were an active avoidance of all of our problems. Like, like we're, 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 we're just like filled up with all of our Monday problems, and, and we say, here, God, take that problem. Well, I'll throw it up there towards you a little higher. Take my Monday, God, please. I don't want it. I'm trying to get rid of it as hard as I can. And all the while, as we are being directed towards our own efforts to get rid of all of our problems, it's so easy to forget that what we stand on is not our own efforts, but the grace of God that is given to us in Jesus Christ, the undeserved love that is ours, because we have entered that rest that only comes through faith in Jesus and his death and his resurrection. You see, being a Christian isn't just some form of positive thinking. It's recognizing our sinfulness, acknowledging our problems, and yet knowing that the only true source of insight is that which doesn't come naturally and isn't dependent upon our native abilities and efforts. And so we acknowledge that we are sinners. We acknowledge the difficulties of this life. But also in faith, we acknowledge the unrivaled gift that is ours in Jesus Christ through faith in him, trusting in him above all else, even our own efforts. We as Lutherans have always proclaimed the importance of grace. And we have always affirmed the power of God's word to reveal that grace to us in the worship service each week. We call it the divine service, and rightly so. Luther connects the Sabbath day, the Sabbath rest, with worship. In his explanation to the third commandment, he says we should fear and love God so that we do not despise preaching and his word, but hold it sacred and gladly hear and learn it. Truly, our Sabbath rest in Jesus Christ is the most restful rest that has ever rested. For as we worship together, we are refreshed and renewed, and our faith is maintained and strengthened through God's word and sacraments. And we are reminded in the light of the gospel that we are recipients of grace, a grace we did not earn, or it would not be grace at all. And a grace that comes about as God's Holy Spirit imbued word works in our hearts. And all we are left with is trust in Jesus and him alone as our Savior, our helper in every need, our Lord and our God. May he be glorified in our lives through the rest that he has so freely given us and may we remain in this rest as our faith is strengthened through regular reception of God's word and sacrament. Boy, it's a good thing to enter God's rest. Amen. Let us now stand as we confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, 
God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated as we worship the Lord through our offering this evening. We invite you to stand as we sing our offertory hymn, Create in Me. pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs for the advancement of Christ's kingdom that we be strong in the Lord and strive to enter into his rest and share this rest with others let us pray to the Lord Lord of the Sabbath let us rest in you for all those who are clothed by Christ by holy in Christ by holy baptism that joined to our Savior and to one another we show forth the goodness of the gospel let us pray to the Lord. Lord of the Sabbath, let us rest in you. For all pastors, DCEs, teachers, musicians, missionaries, and other servants of the church, that their work be a reflection of Christ, whose work enables us to have peace and joy. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord of the Sabbath, let us rest in you. For all who serve in positions of leadership in our government, along with those who wear the uniform of our country, that our Savior, upon whose shoulders the government rests, grant them wisdom, comfort, and satisfaction in their labors. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord of the Sabbath, let us rest in you. For all who are broken in body, mind, or spirit, and for all those that we name in our hearts, that the Lord would bind up their wounds and grant them full healing and restoration, now or in the life to come. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord of the Sabbath, let us rest in you. We give you thanks for your blessings that are new every morning, and we pray your blessings upon the upcoming wedding of Jarrett Rusted and Paula Albright, that their love ever and increasingly reflect your love for them and for all of us in Jesus Christ, who has given us the gift of grace so that we may enter into that promised rest and experience its fullness in the joys one day that we will experience in heaven for the sake of his death and resurrection. We give you thanks that here in this worship service today, as always, we have the opportunity to, to switch from always having to be getting for ourselves and doing for ourselves to being in a position of being a recipient, receiving your grace, receiving your undeserved love, 
And now in this sacrament of the altar, receiving the very body and blood of Jesus Christ once given and shed for us. So into your hands, O Lord, we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy and grace for the sake of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take ye, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. O Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, in giving us your body and blood to eat and to drink, you lead us to remember and confess your holy cross and passion, your blessed death, your rest in the tomb, your resurrection from the dead, your ascension into heaven, and your coming for the final judgment. So remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated and are invited forward for the sacrament of the altar. Uh, also during the distribution of Holy Communion, you're invited to sing our distribution hymns. <laughs> invite you to stand. May this true body and blood of our risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ keep you and strengthen you in the one true faith unto life everlasting. Amen. There remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. In his presence we continue our day and our evening and we begin our our days to come and our weeks to come with his blessing. 
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We remain standing now as we sing our final hymn, Lord, dismiss us with your blessing. May God be with you and ever keep you in his peace and joy and in that promised rest that is ours in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.